Mary Christine Brockert, also known as Tina Marie, was born on March 5, 1956, in Santa Monica, California. She was the daughter of a construction worker named Thomas Leslie and home renovator Mary Ann. She started singing early on, performing Harry Belafonte's Banana Boat Song by the age of two. At the age of eight, her parents started to send her to auditions, of where she eventually gained an acting role on the Beverly Hillbillies, to where she was credited as Tina Marie Brockert. In the episode, she tap danced for Jed Clampett. Tina taught herself how to play guitar, bass, and congas, and would go on to form a semi-professional R&B band with her younger brother Anthony and their cousin. She grew up in a predominantly black area of Venice, California, spending her teen years in the historically black enclave of Oakwood, also known as Venice, Harlem. She formed a strong influence with the neighborhood matriarch, Bertha Lynn Jackson, a black woman that would later become her godmother. In an interview, Tina stated that she had had a lot of black friends and learned a lot about black culture. All of the kids used to call her off-white because she acted sort of black and she stated that she was comfortable with the black kids. Her best friend, Mickey, was a black girl and other kids would chase Tina home calling her an n-word lover. While in high school, Tina joined the summer dance production and was the female lead in the school production of the musical The Music Man. She also fronted the band True Vare from 1974 to 75 with members of her classmates. After graduating from high school, she briefly attended Santa Monica College, then went on to sign with Motown Records. While in college, she had been juggling her English literature studies while also auditioning for various record companies. In 1976, Tina had gained an introduction with Hal Davis, a staff producer from Motown. This led to an audition for a film about orphans that was being developed by the record company, but the project itself was shelved. Fortunately, label boss Barry Gordy was impressed with her singing and decided to sign her on as a solo act. Tina then went on to record unreleased material for the next few years before being discovered by fellow label mate Rick James. She became a protege of Rick James, who had become a star on the label with his album Come Get It. Initially, James was to produce for Diana Ross, but he changed his mind to work with Tina. Initially, her album name was to be Tina Trison, but the name Tina Marie won. Tina released her first album with Rick James as the producer and chief songwriter with his, with his Stone City band backing her musically. The album Wild and Peaceful was released in 1979. The album had her first top hit, I'm a Sucker for Your Love, which was a duet with Rick James. Neither the album or its packaging had her picture on it, and many people thought that she was black during the early part of her career. It was not until 1979 when Tina appeared on Soul Train with Rick James that it was revealed she was white. She was the show's first white guest and would appear eight more times, more than any other white act on the show. It was not until her second album, Lady T, which was released in 1980, that her face was shown on a record cover. The album was produced by Richard Rudolph, as Rick James was unavailable at the time. That same year, she released her third LP called Irons in the Fire, that was handled and produced mostly by herself. This was an achievement for the time, since it was rare for a female artist to do this. Also, in 1980, Tina appeared on the song Fire and Desire with Rick James from his album Street Songs. In an interview, Tina stated that she had had a fever at the time, but was able to record her vocals in one take. After this session, she was driven to a hospital. In 1981, Tina released the album It Must Be Magic, which was her first gold record. Her song Square Biss became one of her biggest hits and was a signature song for the rest of her career. In 1982, Tina got into a legal battle with Motown Records over her contract and disagreements about the release of new material. 
The lawsuit resulted in the Brocker Initiative, which made it illegal for a record company to keep an artist under contract without releasing new material from that artist. In such instances, artists are able to sign and release with another label instead of being held back by an unsupportive one. In an interview, Tina said, It wasn't something I set out to do. I just wanted to get away from Motown and have a good life. But it helped a lot of people like Luther Vandross and the Mary Jane Girls and a lot of different artists to get out of their contracts. Marie then left Motown as the label's most successful white act. In 1982, Tina was contacted by Epic Records in the fall of that year. She had expressed her dismay over her Motown contract and was then signed to a worldwide deal with the Columbia Records subsidiary that also allowed her to establish her own publishing company, Midnight Magnet. On September 18, 1983, she released her fifth album, Robbery, which was a concept album. It was not as successful as the previous release of It Must Be Magic, but it did feature talented artists such as Patrice Russian, Paulino da Costa, and Steve Ferrone. The album is noted for having the song Casanova Brown, which is about her relationship with Rick James. The story behind the song was that, after being signed to Motown and meeting Rick James in the 70s, they began a relationship which started out professional and then progressed to romantic. Eventually, it led to an engagement which they were for a few weeks. When James's alleged infidelities came to light, Tina realized that she was the mistress. Rick James denied ever having romantic relations with Tina, but Alfie Davidson, who was once a girlfriend of Rick James, stated that Tina and Rick were once an item while Alfie was the girlfriend. After the breakup, the relationship waned to tumultuous and the lyrics for the song thinly veil Tina's contempt for the situation. In 1984, Tina released Star Child, which became her biggest selling album and had her biggest hit, Lover Girl. It had a song in tribute to Marvin Gaye, who had been shot in 1984. She was godmother to Marvin's daughter, Nona. In 1986, she released the album Emerald City, which was another concept album. The album was controversial with her established fan base, and it wasn't as successful as her other albums. The album was stylistically different from the others, puzzling fans and critics alike. The album foregoes the R&B and funk elements of her early career and adopts a more electronic synthesizer sound. In my own personal opinion, there are a few good songs from this album, and I personally enjoyed Once Is Not Enough and Love Me Down Easy. In 1988, Tina returned to her roots and released the album Naked to the World, which was critically acclaimed. The album features the famous song, Ooh La La La, which had been sampled heavily by other artists such as the Fugees, Trey Songs, and Redman. Unfortunately, Tina's next album was also unsuccessful with the release of Ivory in 1990. The album was her last with Epic Records and is considered a commercial failure. Her use of hip-hop elements on some tracks once again confused fans and critics. Personally, I really enjoyed some of the songs like The Sugar Shack, though its ending is too long. Other songs like If I Were a Bell, Just Us Two, Mr. Ice Cream, and Snap Your Finger are also good. In my personal opinion, I just think that maybe people weren't too big on the random poems throughout the album. In 1994, Tina released her 10th album, Passion Play, on her own independent label, Sarai. Since she didn't have the backing of a major label, the album had limited distribution and has been long out of print. It has become one of the most sought-after items in her discography. The album is not on Spotify, and copies of it on Amazon go for over $900. There are cheaper copies of it on eBay, and thankfully the songs have been uploaded to YouTube by the generous community. In the 90s, Tina devoted most of her time to raising her daughter, Ollie Rose. During the late 90s, she began working on a new album called Black Rain. 
She didn't want to release it on her label Sarai since Passion Play only had moderate sales. But she wasn't able to secure a major label deal for the album. There was a promotional version released that was bootlegged among fans. The songs from this bootleg version include The Mackin' Game, Baby I'm Your Fiend, My Body's Hungry, I'm On Fire, and more. In 2004, Tina released her 11th album, La Doña, after what was essentially a 10-year hiatus. The album was released on Cash Money Records and became gold certified. The album includes contributions from various artists such as Common, Birdman, MC Light, and of course, Rick James. Rick appeared on the song I Got You, which was his last recording before his death. The album peaked at number 6 on the Billboard 200, which was her highest placing entry on the chart. She performed the song My Body's Hungry on the show The Parkers in 2000. Songs that were bootlegged from the Black Rain album would also appear on this one. In 2006, she released the album Sapphire, which peaked at number 3 on the U.S. R&B album charts and number 24 on the Billboard. In 2009, Tina released Congo Square, which would be her last before her death. The album peaked at number 4 on the R&B charts and featured collaborations with multiple artists, including her daughter, Rose LeBeau, Alia Rose's stage name. In 2004, when Tina was sleeping in a hotel room, a large picture frame fell and struck her on the head. The blow caused a serious concussion that would cause momentary seizures for the rest of her life. In an interview with the Associated Press, she also stated that a sub-zero refrigerator fell on her and she fell into an addiction with Vicodin after the passing of Rick James. On the afternoon of December 26, 2010, Tina Marie was found dead at her Pasadena home by her daughter Alia. On December 30th of that year, an autopsy was performed and they found no signs of apparent trauma or discernible cause of death, concluding that she died from natural causes. She had suffered a generalized tonic-clonic seizure a month before. A memorial service was held at Forest Lawn Cemetery on January 10th, 2011. People from the community attended her services, such as Stevie Wonder, Smokey Robinson, Queen Latifah, Sinbad, and Barry Gordy Jr. Tina was then cremated, with her ashes given to her family. She was 54 years old. Before her death, Tina had been working on more songs for a new album. Through the joint effort of her daughter, Alia Rose, the album Beautiful was released on January 13, 2013. On January 15, 2013, it features artists such as Smokey Robinson, Curtis Mayfield, and even Rose LeBeau. Her daughter, Alia, has dabbled in music herself with two songs on her SoundCloud and a music video released on YouTube in 2015. Tina is quoting as having said, Overall, my race hasn't been a problem. I'm a black artist with white skin. At the end of the day, you have to sing what's in your soul.